home computers were a class of microcomputers entering the market in 1977, and becoming common during the 1980s. They were marketed to consumers as affordable and accessible computers that, for the first time, were intended for the use of a single non-technical user. These computers were a distinct market segment that typically cost much less than business, scientific or engineering-oriented computers of the time such as the IBM PC, and were generally less powerful in terms of memory and expandability. However, a home computer often had better graphics and sound than contemporary business computers. Their most common use was playing video games. Home computers were usually not electronic kits, since the home computer was sold already manufactured. There were, however, commercial kits like the Sinclair ZX80 which were both home and home-built computers since the purchaser could assemble the unit from a kit. Advertisements for early home computers were rife with possibilities for their practical use in the home, from cataloging recipes to personal finance to home automation, but these were seldom realized in practice. For example, using a typical 1980s home computer as a home automation appliance would require the computer to be kept powered on at all times and dedicated to this task. Personal finance and database use required tedious data entry. By contrast, advertisements in the speciality computer press often simply listed specifications. If no packaged software was available for a particular application, the home computer user was required to learn computer programming. A significant time commitment many new computer owners weren't willing to make. Still, for others the home computer offered the first opportunity to learn to program. Today the line between business and home computer market segments has blurred or vanished completely, since both categories of computers now typically use the same processor architectures, peripherals, operating systems, and applications. Often the only difference may be the sales outlet through which they are purchased. Another change from the home computer era is that the once common endeavor of writing one's own software programs has almost vanished from home computer use. Background, as early as 1965, some experimental projects such as Jim Sutherland's Echo 4 explored the possible utility of a computer in the home. In 1969, the Honeywell Kitchen computer was marketed as a luxury gift item, and would have inaugurated the era of home computing, but none were sold. Computers became affordable for the general public in the 1970s due to the mass production of the microprocessor starting in 1971. Early microcomputers such as the Altair 8800 had front-mounted switches and blink lights to control and indicate internal system status, and were often sold in kit form to hobbyists. These kits would contain an empty printed circuit board which the buyer would fill with the integrated circuits, other individual electronic components, wires and connectors, and then hand-solder all the connections. While two early home computers could be bought either in kit form or assembled, most home computers were only sold pre-assembled. They were enclosed in plastic or metal cases similar in appearance to typewriter or hi-fi equipment enclosures, which were more familiar and attractive to consumers than the industrial metal card cage enclosures used by the Altair and similar computers. The keyboard, a feature lacking on the Altair, was usually built into the same case as the motherboard. Ports for plug-in peripheral devices such as a video display cassette tape recorders, joysticks, and disk drives either were built in or available on expansion cards. Although the Apple II series had internal expansion slots, most other home computer models' expansion arrangements were through externally accessible expansion ports that also served as a place to plug in cartridge-based games. Usually the manufacturer would sell peripheral devices designed to be compatible with their computers as extra-cost accessories. Peripherals were not often interchangeable between different brands of home computer, or even between successive models of the same brand. To save the cost of a dedicated monitor, the home computer often would connect through an RF modulator to the family TV set, which served as both video display and sound system. After the success of the Radio Shack TRS-80, the Commodore PET and the Apple II in 1977, Almost every manufacturer of consumer electronics rushed to introduce a home computer. Large numbers of new machines of all types began to appear during the late 1970s and early 1980s. Mattel, 
Coleco, Texas Instruments and Timex, none of which had any previous connection to the computer industry, all had short-lived home computer lines in the early 1980s. Some home computers were more successful a Euro the BBC Micro, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, Atari 800XL and Commodore 64, sold many units over several years and attracted third-party software development. By 1982, an estimated 621,000 home computers were in use in the United States, at an average sales price of $530. Almost universally, home computers had a basic interpreter combined with a line editor and permanent read-only memory which one could use to type in basic programs and execute them immediately or save them to tape or disk. In direct mode, the basic interpreter was also used as the user interface, and given tasks such as loading, saving, managing, and running files. One exception was the Jupiter Ace, which had a fourth interpreter instead of basic. A built-in programming language was seen as a requirement for any computer of the era, and was the main feature setting home computers apart from video game consoles. Still, home computers competed in the same market as the consoles. A home computer was often seen as simply as a higher-end purchase than a console adding abilities to what would still be mainly a gaming device. A common marketing tactic was to show a computer system and console playing games side by side, then emphasizing the computer's greater ability by showing it running user-created programs, education software, word processing, spreadsheet and other applications while the game console showed a blank screen or continued playing the same repetitive game. Some game consoles offered programming packs consisting of a version of BASIC in a ROM cartridge. Atari's BASIC programming for the Atari 2600 was one of these. For the ColecoVision console, Coleco even announced an expansion module which would convert it into a full-fledged computer system. This never materialized, but a standalone computer, the Coleco Adam was eventually released. The Magnavox Odyssey Squared game console had a built-in keyboard to support its C7420 home computer module. Books of type and program listings were available for most models of computer with titles along the lines of 64 amazing basic games for the Commodore 64. While most of the programs in these books were short and simple games or demos, some titles such as Compute, a speed script series, contain productivity software that rivaled commercial packages. To avoid the tedious process of typing in a program listing from a book, these books would sometimes include a mail and offer from the author to obtain the programs on disk or cassette for a few dollars. Before the Internet, and before most computer owners had a modem, books were a popular and low-cost means of software distribution. They also served a role in familiarizing new computer owners with the concepts of programming. Some titles added suggested modifications to the program listings for the user to carry out. Modifying software to be compatible with one's system or writing a utility program to fit one's needs was a skill every advanced computer owner was expected to have. During the peak years of the home computer market, scores of models were produced, usually with little or no thought given to compatibility between different manufacturers or even within product lines of the same manufacturer. Except for the Japanese MSX standard, the concept of a computer platform was still forming, with most companies considering basic compatibility sufficient. Things were different in the business world, where cost-conscious small business owners had been using CPM running on Z80-based computers from Osborne, K-Pro, Morrow Designs and a host of other manufacturers. For many of these businesses, the development of the microcomputer is what made computer systems affordable where they had not been before. Introduced in August 1981, the IBM personal computer would eventually become the standard platform used in business, due to the IBM name and the system's open architecture, which encouraged production of third-party clones. The 6502-based Apple II series had carved out a niche for itself in business, thanks to the industry's first killer app, the CCALC, released in 1979. However the Apple II would quickly be displaced for office use by IBM PC compatibles running Lotus 1-2-3. Apple Computer's 1984 release of the Apple Macintosh introduced the modern GUI to the market, 
which IBM compatible computers would eventually adopt. Throughout the 1980s, PCs became popular with businesses, leading, by the end of the decade, to sub $1,000 IBM PC XT class white box machines, usually built in Asia and sold by U.S. companies like PCs Limited. In 1980, Wayne Green, the publisher of Kiloboard Microcomputing, recommended that companies avoid the term home computer in their advertising as I feel is self limiting for sales. I prefer the term microcomputers since it doesn't limit the uses of the equipment in the imagination of the prospective customers. By the mid 1980s, most computer companies are Euro, even those with a majority of sales to home users are Euro avoided the term home computer because of its association with the image of, as compute. Wrote, a low-powered, low-end machine primarily suited for playing games. Apple's John Scully, for example, denied that his company sold home computers. Rather, he said, Apple sold computers for use in the home. In 1990 the company reportedly refused to support joysticks on its low-cost Macintosh LC and ISI computers to prevent customers from considering them as game machines. Price wars drove the consumer electronics companies from the market, as they could no longer sustain development of what had become, for them, money-losing projects. In the late 1980s, clones also became popular with non-corporate customers. Inexpensive, Highly compatible clones succeeded where IBM's PCJR had failed. Replacing the technophile hobbyists who had made up the majority of the home computer market, were, as compute. Describe them, people who want to take work home from the office now and then, play a game now and then, learn more about computers, and help educate their children. By 1986 industry experts predicted an MS-DOS Christmas and the magazine stated that clones threatened Commodore, Atari, and Apple's domination of the home computer market. The declining cost of IBM compatibles on the one hand, and the greatly increased graphics, sound, and storage abilities of fourth-generation video game consoles such as the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo Entertainment System on the other, combined to cause the market segment for home computers to vanish by the early 1990s in the U.S. In Europe, the home computer remained a distinct presence for a few years more, with the Amiga and Atari street lines being the dominant players, but today a computer bought for home use anywhere will be very similar to those used in a FISA Euro made by the same manufacturers, with compatible peripherals, operating systems, and application software. Technology Many home computers were superficially similar. Most had a keyboard integrated into the same case as the motherboard. Sometimes a cheap to make membrane or chiclet keyboard in the early days, although full travel keyboards quickly became universal due to overwhelming consumer preference. Most systems could use an RF modulator to display 20 a Euro 40 column text output on a home television. Indeed, the use of a television set as a display almost defines the pre PC home computer. Although dedicated composite or green screen computer displays were available for this market segment and offered a sharper display, a monitor was often a later purchase made only after users had bought a floppy disk drive, printer, modem, and the other pieces of a full system. This peripheral sold separately approach is another defining characteristic of the home computer era. Many first-time computer buyers brought a base C64 system home and hooked it up to their TV only to find they needed to buy a compatible disk drive or data set before they could make use of it as anything but a game machine. In the early part of the 1980s, the dominant microprocessors used in home computers were the 8-bit MOS Technology 6502 and Zilog Z80. One exception was the TI-99 series. Announced in 1979 with a 16-bit TMS 9900 CPU. Processor clock rates were typically 1 a Euro 2 a megahertz for 6502 based CPUs and 2 a Euro 4 a megahertz for Z80 based systems, but this aspect was not emphasized by users or manufacturers, as the system's limited RAM capacity, graphics abilities and storage options had a more perceivable effect on performance than CPU speed. Clock rate was considered a technical detail of interest only to users needing accurate timing for their own programs. To economize on component cost, 
often the same crystal used to produce color television compatible signals was also divided down and used for the processor clock. This meant processors rarely operated at their full rated speed, and had the side effect that European and North American versions of the same home computer operated at slightly different speeds and different video resolution due to different television standards. Initially, many home computers used the then ubiquitous compact audio cassette as a storage mechanism. A rough analogy to how this worked would be to place a recorder on the phone line as a file was uploaded by modem to save it, and playing the recording back through the modem to load. Most cassette implementations were notoriously slow and unreliable, but early 5.25 inches form factor drives were priced for business use, out of reach of most home buyers. Eventually mass production of 5.25 inches drives resulted in lower prices, and after about 1984 cassette drives were phased out of the U.S. home computer market 5.25 floppy disk drives would remain standard until the end of the 8-bit era. Though external 3.5 inches drives were made available for home computer systems toward the latter part of the 1980s, almost all software sold for 8-bit home computers remained on 5.25 disks. 3.5 inches drives were used for data storage. Standardization of disk formats was not common. Sometimes even different models from the same manufacturer used different disk formats. Toward the end of the home computer era, drives for a number of home computer models appeared offering disk format compatibility with the IBM PC. The disk drives sold with the Commodore 128, Amiga and Atari Street were all able to read and write PC disks which themselves were undergoing the transition from 5.25 inches to 3.5 format at the time. Hard drives were never popular on home computers, remaining an expensive, niche product mainly for BBS hobbyists and the few business users. Various copy protection schemes were developed for floppy disks. Most were broken in short order. Many users would only tolerate copy protection for games, as wear and tear on disks was a significant issue in an entirely floppy-based system. The ability to make a working backup disk of vital application software was seen as important. Copy programs that advertised their ability to copy or even remove common protection schemes were a common category of utility software in this pre-DMCA era. In another defining characteristic of the home computer, instead of a command line, the basic interpreter served double duty as a user interface. Coupled to a character-based screen or line editor, BASIC's file management commands could be entered in direct mode. In contrast to modern computers, home computers most often had their operating systems stored in ROM chips. This made startup times very fast a euro no more than a few seconds a euro, but made OS upgrades difficult or impossible without buying a new unit. Usually only the most severe bugs were fixed by issuing new ROMs to replace the old ones at the user's cost. Although modern operating systems include extensive programming libraries to ease development and promote standardization, home computer operating systems provided little support to application programs. However, professionally written software often switched out the ROM-based OS anyway to free the address space it occupied and maximize RAM capacity. This gave the program full control of the hardware and allowed the programmer to optimize performance for a specific task. As multitasking was never common on home computers, this practice went largely unnoticed by users. Most software even lacked an exit command, requiring a reboot to use the system for something else. In an enduring reflection of their early cassette-oriented nature, most home computers loaded their disk operating systems separately from the main OS. The DOS was only used for disk and file related commands and was not required to perform other computing functions. One exception was Commodore DOS, which was not loaded into the computer's main memory at all. A Euro Commodore disk drives contained a 6502 processor and DOS in ROM. Many home computers had a cartridge interface which accepted ROM based software. This was also used for expansion or upgrades such as fast loaders. Application software on cartridge did exist, which loaded instantly and eliminated the need for disk swapping on single drive setups, but the vast majority of cartridges were games. From about 1985, 
the high end of the home computer market began to be dominated by next-generation home computers using the 16-bit Motorola 68000 chip, which enabled the greatly increased abilities of the Amiga and Atari Street series. Graphics resolutions approximately doubled to give roughly NTSC class resolution, and color palettes increased from dozens to hundreds or thousands of colors available. Stereo sound became standard for the first time. Clock rates on the 68,000-based systems were approximately 8 MHz with RAM capacities of 256 KB up to 1024 KB. These systems used 3.5 inches floppy disks from the beginning but 5.25 drives were made available to facilitate data exchange with IBM PC compatibles. The Amiga and Street both had GUIs inspired by the Apple Macintosh, but at a list price of $2,495, the Macintosh itself was too expensive for most households. Radio frequency interference After the first wave of computers landed in American homes, the United States Federal Communications Commission began receiving complaints of electromagnetic interference to television reception. By 1979 the FCC demanded that home computer makers submit samples for radio frequency interference testing. It was found that first-generation home computers emitted too much radio frequency noise for household use. The Atari 400 and 800 were designed with heavy RF shielding to meet the new requirements. Between 1980 and 1982 regulations governing RF emittance from home computers were phased in. Some companies appealed to the FCC to waive the requirements for home computers, while others objected to the waiver. Eventually techniques to suppress interference became standardized. The Home Computer Revolution In the late 1970s and early 1980s, from about 1977 to 1983, it was widely predicted that computers would soon revolutionize many aspects of home and family life as they had business practices in the previous decades. Mothers would keep their recipe catalog in kitchen computer databases and turn to a medical database for help with child care, fathers would use the family's computer to manage family finances and track automobile maintenance. Children would use online encyclopedias for school work and would be avid video gamers. The computer would even be tasked with babysitting younger children. Home automation would bring about the intelligent home of the 80s. Using Bidotex, NAPLPS or some sort of as yet unrealized computer technology, television would gain interactivity. It would be possible to do the week's grocery shopping through the television. The personalized newspaper was another commonly predicted application. Morning coffee would be brewed automatically under computer control. The same household computer would control the home's lighting and temperature. Robots would take the garbage out and be programmed to perform new tasks via the home computer. Electronics were expensive, so it was generally assumed that each home would have only one computer for the entire family to use. Home control would be performed in a multitasking time-sharing arrangement, with interfaces to the various devices it was expected to control. All this was predicted to be commonplace sometime before the end of the decade. But by 1987 Dan Gutman wrote that the predicted revolution was in shambles, with only 15% of American homes owning a computer. Virtually every aspect that was foreseen would be delayed to later years or would be entirely surpassed by later technological developments. The home computers of the early 1980s could not multitask. Even if they could, other technical limitations predominated. Memory capacities were too small to hold entire encyclopedias or databases of financial records. Floppy disk-based storage was inadequate in both capacity and speed for multimedia work. And the home computer's graphics chips could only display blocky, unrealistic images and blurry, jagged text that would be difficult to read in newspaper from. Although CD-ROM technology was introduced in 1985 with much promise for its future use, the drives were prohibitively expensive and only interfaced with IBM PCs and compatibles. Gutman wrote that when the first computer boom ended in 1984, suddenly, everybody was saying that the home computer was a fad, just another hula hoop. A backlash set in a Euro computer users were geeks, nerds, or worse, hackers. 
the North American video game crash of 1983 soured many on home computer technology as users saw large investments in the technology of the future turn into dead ends when manufacturers pulled out of the market or went out of business. The computers that were bought for use in the family room were either forgotten in closets or relegated to basements and children's bedrooms to be used exclusively for games and the occasional book report. Home computers of the 1980s have been called a technology in search of a use. A 1985 study found that, during a typical week, 40% of adult computer owners did not use their computers at all. Usage rates among children were higher, with households reporting that only 16-20% to of children aged 6 a year 17 did not use the computer during a typical week. In 1977, Referring to computers used in home automation at the dawn of the home computer era, Digital Equipment Corporation CEO Ken Olson is quoted as saying there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. It would take another 10 years for technology to mature, for the graphical user interface to make the computer approachable for non-technical users, and for the World Wide Web to provide a compelling reason for most people to want a computer in their homes. Separate 1998 studies found that 75% of Americans with Internet access accessed primarily from home and that not having Internet access at home inhibited Internet use. Predicted aspects of the revolution were left by the wayside or modified in the face of an emerging reality. The cost of electronics dropped precipitously and today many families have a computer for each family member, or a laptop for mom's active lifestyle a desktop for dad with the kids sharing a computer. Encyclopedias, recipe catalogs and medical databases are kept online and accessed over the World Wide Web a year are not stored locally on floppy disks or CD-ROM. TV has yet to gain substantial interactivity. Instead, the web has evolved alongside television, giving rise to the second screen concept. The HTPC and services like Netflix, Google TV or Apple TV along with Internet video sites such as YouTube and Hulu may one day replace traditional broadcast and cable television. Our coffee may be brewed automatically every morning, but the computer is a simple one embedded in the coffee maker, not under external control. As of 2008, robots are just beginning to make an impact in the home, with Roomba and Ibo leading the charge. This delay wasn't out of keeping with other technologies newly introduced to an unprepared public. Early motorists were widely derided with the cry of get a horse. Until the automobile was accepted. Television languished in research labs for decades before regular public broadcasts began. In an example of changing applications for technology, before the invention of radio, the telephone was used to distribute opera and news reports whose subscribers were denounced as illiterate, blind, bedridden and incurably lazy people. Likewise, the acceptance of computers into daily life today is a product of continuing refinement of both technology and perception. Use in the 21st century, as older computer hardware ages and the supply of replacement parts dwindles, it has become popular among enthusiasts to emulate these machines, recreating their environments on modern hardware. One of the more well-known emulators is the multi-emulator super system which can emulate most of the better-known home computers. A more or less complete list of home computer emulators can be found in the List of Computer System Emulators article. Games for many 8- and 16-bit home computers are becoming available for the Wii Virtual Console. Retrocomputing is the use of real hardware, possibly performing modern tasks such as surfing the web and email. Throughout the 1990s and first decade of the 21st century, many home computer systems were available inexpensively at garage sales and on eBay. Many enthusiasts have started to collect home computers, with older and rarer systems being much sought after. Sometimes the collections turn into a virtual museum presented on websites. The Commodore 64 has been repackaged as the C1 and C64 Director TV both designed by Jerry Ellsworth with modern enhancements. Notable Home Computers The timeline below describes many of the most popular or significant home computers of the late 1970s and of the 1980s. The most popular home computers in the USA up to 1985 were, the TRS-80, various models of the Apple II family, 
the Atari 400-800 along with its follow-up models the 800XL and 130XE, and the Commodore VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. The VIC was the first computer of any type to sell over 1 million units, and the 64 is still the highest-selling single model of personal computer ever, with over 17 million produced before production stopped in 1994 AA Euro a 12-year run with only minor changes. In Europe the situation was slightly different, as many of the British-made systems like Sinclair ZX81 and Spectrum, and later the Amstrad Schneider CPC were much cheaper in Europe than US systems. The reverse was also true, as popular British systems like the Spectrum never became popular in the US. A few British Sinclair models were sold for low prices in the US by Timex Corporation, such as the Timex Sinclair 1000 and the ill-fated Timex Sinclair 2068, but never established a strong following. The result was that these British systems were much more popular in Europe than in the USA, the only notable exception being the Commodore 64, which competed favorably price-wise with the British systems, and was the most popular system in Europe as in the USA. Until the introduction of the IBM PC in 1981, Computers such as the Apple II and TRS-80 also found considerable use in office work. In 1983 IBM introduced the PCJ in an attempt to continue their business computer success in the home computer market, but incompatibilities between it and the standard PC kept users away. The Commodore PET had a sizable presence in the North American education market until that segment was largely ceded to the Apple II as Commodore focused on the C64's success in the mass retail market. 1970s, three microcomputers were the prototypes for what would later become the home computer market segment. But when introduced they sold as much to hobbyists and small businesses as to the home. June 1977, Apple II, Color Graphics eight expansion slots. One of the first computers to use a typewriter-like plastic case design. August 1977, Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80, first home computer for less than 600 US dollars, used a dedicated monitor for US Federal Communications Commission rules compliance. October 1977, Commodore PET, first all-in-one computer. Keyboard tape storage built into stamped sheet metal enclosure. The following computers also introduced significant advancements to the home computer segment, 1979 TI-99 April, first home computer with a 16-bit processor and first to add sprite graphics. 1979, Atari 400-800, first computer with custom chipset and programmable video chip and built-in audio output. 1980s. 1980, Commodore VIC-20, under 300 US dollars. First computer of any kind to pass 1 million sold. 1980, TRS-80 color computer, Motorola 6809, optional OS 9 multi-user multitasking. June 1981, Texas Instruments TI-99 Quarters A, based on the less successful TI-99 Quarters. 1981, Sinclair ZX81, A49 pounds and 95 pennies in kit form. A69 pounds and 95 pennies pre-built, released as Timex Sinclair 1000 in US in 1982. 1981, BBC Micro, premier educational computer in the UK for a decade. Advanced BBC Basic with integrated 6502 machine code assembler, featured a myriad of I.O. ports, 1.5 million sold. April 1982, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, best-selling British home computer. Catalyzed the UK software industry, widely cloned by the Soviet Union. June 1982, Micro B, initially as a kit, then as a finished unit. August 1982, Dragon 32 became, for a short time, the best-selling home micro in the United Kingdom. August 1982, Commodore 64, Custom graphic and synthesizer chipset, best-selling computer model of all time, 17 million sold. January 1983, Apple II, Apple II enhanced. Reduced component count and production costs enabled high-volume production, until 1993. 1983, 
Acorn Electron A stripped-down sibling of the BBC microcomputer with limited functionality. The Electron recovered from a slow start to become one of the more popular home computers of that era in the UK. 1983, Coleco Adam, one of the few home computers to be sold only as a complete system with storage device and printer. Cousin to the Coleco Vision game console. One of the first systems to be orphaned by its maker, a casualty of the North American video game crash of 1983. 1983, MSX, a computer reference designed by ASCII and Microsoft, produced by several companies, 5 million sold. 1983, VTEC Laser 200, entry-level computer aimed at being the cheapest on market, also sold as Solora Fellow, Texit Texas, 8000 and Dick Smith VZ200. 1983, Oric 1 and Oric Atmos, a home computer equipped with a full travel keyboard and an extended version of Microsoft Basic in ROM. January 1984, the Apple Macintosh is introduced, providing many consumers their first look at a graphical user interface, which would eventually replace the home computer as it was known. April 1984, Apple Eric, Apple II Compact. No expansion slots, and built-in ports for pseudo plug-and-play ease of use. The Apple II most geared to home use, to complement the Apple II's dominant education market share. 1984, TKI 100, Zilog Z80-based home educational computer made by TKI Data. 1984, Amstrad Schneider, CPC, PCW ranges, British Standard before IBM PC. German sales next to C64. 1985, Electronica BK0010, one of the first 16-bit home computers. Made in USSR. 1985. Robotron KC85-1, one of the few home computers produced by the East German VEB Robotron Mia Electronic Otto Paragraph N Dresden, 1985, Atari Street, first with a graphical user interface for less than $1,000. First with built-in MIDI interface. Also 1 MB RAM for under $1,000. June 1985, Commodore 128 Final. Most advanced 8-bit Commodore, retained full C64 compatibility while adding CPM in a complex multi-mode architecture, July 1985, Commodore Amiga, custom chip set for graphics and digital audio. Multitasking OS with both GUI and CLI interfaces. Motorola 68000 processor. 1986, Apple IIGS, fifth and final model in the Apple II series with greatly enhanced graphics and sound abilities. Used a 16-bit 65C816 CPU, the same as used in the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. 1987, Acorn Archimedes, launched with an 8 MHz 32-bit ARM2 microprocessor, with between 512 KB and 4 MB of RAM, and an optional 20 or 40 MB hard drive. 1989, Sam Cooper Copyright, based on 6 MHz Z80 microprocessor. Marketed as a logical upgrade from the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. See also, Child Computer, Computer Magazines, History of Computing Hardware, Home Built Computer, Honeywell 316 A Home Computer from 1969, List of Home Computers, List of Home Computers by Category, List of Home Computers by Video Hardware. List of video game consoles, influence of the IBM PC on the personal computer market, microprocessor development board and list of early microcomputers, first microprocessor-based systems used by hobbyists, personal computer, Pirates of Silicon Valley, docu-fiction focused on Apple and Microsoft evolution, triumph of the nerds, video display controller, chips that were used to create the video graphics. Of many early home computers, References External links, Runes PC Museum, Home of the Home Computer, Collection of Old Analog and Digital Computers at Old Computer Museum, Computer History Museum a Euro and Online Museum of Home Computing and Gaming, HCM, Home Computer Museum, Total Share, 30 Years of Personal Computer Market Share Figures AA Euro from Ars Technica, Article on Computing in the 1980s, 
Google Books link to A History of the Personal Computer, The People and the Technology by Roy A. Allon.